Hi guys, we're going to look today at the establishment of several other colonies. Now just as religious freedom was very important for the first Puritans settling first at Plymouth and then later in Massachusetts Bay, um, seeking religious freedom was also similarly important for William Penn, a Quaker leader who uh, was the founder of Pennsylvania. He'll be granted uh, a royal tract of land for he and uh, his fellow Quaker um, uh, believers to finally settle on. You'll notice it's a little bit of a later date, 1681. But Pennsylvania was specifically created as a colony to provide religious freedom for people of all different faiths. This is where Pennsylvania is different than, say, Massachusetts or Plymouth Colony, where the Puritans tended to discriminate and actually sometimes kill people of other faiths. In Pennsylvania, the Quakers, or the Society of Friends, that was their formal title, the Quakers welcomed everyone. And so before long, you have Baptists, you have Methodists, you have Mennonites, Nights, you have Amish. Uh, these peoples begin uh, flocking to Pennsylvania with the understanding um, that they will be able to practice their faith as they see fit without discrimination. And true to his word, that is what Pennsylvania turned into, sort of a, a safe haven for people of different faiths. Not only that, but William Penn was also committed to dealing with Native Americans fairly. So of all the original colonies, we see some of the most peaceful relationships between the English and the Native peoples happening in Pennsylvania because Penn was very insistent about not swindling the Native peoples out of their land, but, but trying to negotiate peace fully with them at all times. Uh, would that other colonies, English colonies, followed William Penn's lead? Unfortunately, they did not. Now, moving on, we need to talk about a very popular system of forced labor in the colonies. Um, if you could think back when the first Europeans got to the Americas, they immediately began enslaving the native peoples to perform all of the heavy labor. This did not work out over time, though, because the Native Americans were able to either successfully run away and elude uh, recapture, or, more ominously, many of them were perishing due to the introduction of European diseases, so their numbers are simply diminishing over time. So, as more and more English migrants come to North America and with a declining Native American population, they're looking for another system of labor to work in the tobacco fields or to work in industry in uh, the northern colonies. So indentured servitude will develop and become by far the most popular and widespread system of labor really for the first 50 years or so of English settlement. And the situation was this. Um, indentured servants were those that typically signed the terms of an indenture, a contract, that usually specified that in exchange for the plantation owner paying for your passage across the Atlantic Ocean, a very costly trip, that many people from poor backgrounds could not afford on their own. An indenture is a contract that they sign with a plantation owner. You pay for my passage to the New World. I will agree to work off that debt. I will agree to labor for you for a period of usually five to seven years. And at the end, if you fulfilled the, the terms of your labor contract, you were then given your freedom and sometimes some tools and maybe a little bit of money, some seed corn, and pat it on the back and basically told to go find your own way in the world. Now this system was so popular that historians estimate that between one half to two thirds of all immigrants to colonial America originally arrived as indentured servants. That's pretty staggering, more than half the population. At times as many as 75 percent of some of these colonial towns were under, uh, the peoples living there were under some form of indenture. Now it seems like a win-win uh, for the poorer classes in England. They get a chance to come across the ocean and seek a better life. And certainly that was a chance at a future that many of them thought that maybe they would never have. And it seems like a win-win from the standpoint of the plantation owner. They have lots of land, but they need warm bodies to come out and cultivate that land. So this is how the system starts out. It will quickly fall out of favor, though, this system of indentured servitude, for several different reasons. Probably first and foremost, what you end up seeing are a number of those indentured servants who agree to these terms don't abide by those terms over time. They will end up violating the terms of their contracts. 
for example, you can see several early cases from the Virginia colony whereby indentured servants have simply taken off. They have uh, absented themselves uh, in the terms of the court here on the slide. They've, they've, you know, basically took off and tried to avoid recapture. For those that were captured and brought back, some of them faced very severe whipping, uh, public humiliation as a result. And so this kind of gives you a little bit of an indication why some of these people maybe never, didn't want to remain as indentured servants. Indentured servants had virtually no rights. They are uh, like a half a step above slaves, meaning that, for instance, indentured servitudes cannot, servants cannot leave the plantation without their owner's permission. They also cannot marry without their owner's permission. They can be subject to brutal physical punishment, such as whipping at the whim of the master. In some cases, they were not really fed adequately or given proper housing. So it's kind of understandable why the system will start to break down over time, because for many of these indentured servants, they think, this is not what I thought I was signing up for. I'm leaving. All right, and so from the standpoint of owners, the, this also hastens the, the, uh, the dissolution of this labor system because owners get to the point where they don't, they're not willing to take the gamble. They're not willing to spend the money on indentured servants and pay all that money up front and then not recoup on their investment by their, their uh, servants running away prematurely. Another problem with these runaway indentured servants is, is they blend in seamlessly with colonial society. These are people that look just like everyone else. They speak the same language as everyone else. So trying to recapture and bring back one of these indentured servants just becomes more trouble than it's worth over time for plantation owners. Another problem with indentured servitude is for those that do honor the terms of their contract, they serve their time, they now have achieved their liberty. There's no land, there's no affordable farmland for them to, uh, to take control of so that they can support their families. For many of these newly uh, freed men, they have to move west, which is to say moving inland, away from the coastal areas, away from some of the prime real estate of the day, to find cheap available farmland. The problem with that is, is in inland areas, the land sometimes is not as good for farming as it is near the coastal and river bottom regions. Worse is the further west you move, the more likely you will encounter Native American attack. So what you end up seeing is, and I've given you a new term here on this slide, the gentry in Virginia Colony, that simply refers to the very wealthy landowning class. In, in many of the southern colonies. They're sometimes referred to as the southern gentry. Uh, in some cases, they own thousands of acres of land, and much like today, their economic power often translated into political power. They tended to dominate the political system in some of these southern um, colonies, as well as, as having the lion's share of money. So when I talk about class tensions arising as a result of these newly freed indentured servants, they feel like the gentry in many cases are snubbing them socially. They're looking down on them. And they're angry that the gentry have most of the political power in these colonies and that the gentry tend to sit on all the prime real estate, forcing them to move west and risk their lives. So I mention all of this in a bigger sense so that we can understand the first popular uprising in the English colonies, which will be Bacon's Rebellion, that will take place, it will erupt in Virginia in uh, 1675. And if you can look at the slide and see the factors that led to the rebellion, I kind of break them down one after the other. We've seen tobacco prices falling recently in the Virginia colony. A lot of this has to do with as more and more people flock to that colony and start planting and growing tobacco. It causes a, a, an, an oversupply of it. And anytime you have too much of one product dumped out for sale on the market at the same time as everyone else, it's going to depress the price of that product. So by the 1660s and 1670s, as uh, tobacco farming becomes more popular, it starts to cause a problem with tobacco prices taking a nosedive. Now, while some of the gentry are wealthy enough to kind of ride out a few bad years of uh, falling tobacco prices for the newly freed 
indentured servants, the poor farmers, uh, you know, they cannot, and this is causing serious economic hardship for them. This coupled with the fact, you'll notice that I have higher taxes on here, you're seeing the tax rate is essentially flat, or it's the same across the board in Virginia Colony. This, despite the fact that you have people who are sometimes very, very wealthy among the gentry, and people who are very, very poor, yet they're paying the same amount in taxes. As one of the rebels that participated in Bacon's uh, rebellion said, quote, a poor man who has only his labor to maintain himself and his family pays as much in taxes as a man who has 20,000 acres. So this is considered to be very, very unfair that uh, for poorer people they should have a lower tax rate. There's also the issue of poor farmers losing the vote. In the House of Burgesses there in the Virginia Colony, you've had some property holding requirements being put into place in recent years leading up to the rebellion, meaning that if you don't own property, you can't even vote for someone in the legislature. So again, for many of these newly freed uh, former indentured servants who have no property to their name, they are being kept out of the political system, and they do not like this. And then finally, there's the, the chronic issue of, for those farmers forced to move west, those that are exposed to potential Native American attack, they have been complaining for years to Governor Barkley, we need more troops on the frontier. We need to be able to defend ourselves. Barkley has consistently refused to send out a large military force to the frontier, however, mainly because he was worried about it triggering a full-scale war between a number of tribes and the settlers in his colony. All right, so then when a man by the name of Nathaniel Bacon steps into Virginia Colony, the fact that he actually was of fairly wealthy lineage, uh, that didn't matter. He quickly uh, became kind of aware of some of these class tensions and, and undercurrents going on, and he sided with the poorer farmers, uh, the indentured servants, even you know, some of the slaves it will end up joining this rebellion, African slaves, all as sort of a general protest against years worth of social snubbing and harsh economic and political conditions. So Berkeley, um, you know, really is power hungry. There's no other word for it. He senses this as an opportunity for him to be able to make a name for himself and to earn more popularity amongst the colonists. So he will begin demanding, not asking, but demanding Governor Barkley of the Virginia colony to give him a military military commission to send troops out to the frontier to start wiping out Native American peoples. According to Nathaniel Bacon, the only good Indian was a dead Indian in his view of things. But Governor Barkley said, I don't think so. Uh, this is going to trigger the very thing I don't want, a mass war on the frontier. Bacon decided to do things any, his way anyway. He led his men to a fort held by a friendly tribe, the Okanichis, and convinced them to aid the Englishmen in capturing warriors from an unfriendly tribe. Uh, so he is enlisting the help of one tribe to capture another tribe. When both of those uh, tribes are, are in front of him, he then opens fire on the friendly tribe and the one that had been waging war against the English settlers. Governor Barclay is very much alone. Bacon was condemned as a rebel and was arrested, but a public wave of popular support for Nathaniel Bacon basically forced the governor to not only release him from jail, but help him get elected to the House of Burgesses. However, this was too little too late for many of those in the Virginia colony. Bacon and his followers were still angry over high taxes, the colony's Native American policy, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, years worth of social snobbery as far as they were concerned. Soon thereafter, Bacon, backed with by 400 armed men, issued a declaration that all Indians needed to be killed or removed, and that the rule of the rich, or the gentry class, that it was time for that to come to an end in Virginia Colony. Bacon's men then uh, left Jamestown, rallied a mob, began attacking Native American tribes, then marched back to the capital, uh, to the House of Burgesses. And along the way, he and his men began wreaking havoc um, and busting into plantations, setting them on fire, looting them. And who knows how much further this chaos would have gone had not Bacon ended up developing probably severe amoebic dysentery, which led to him dying very quickly of, rather unpleasantly too, of bloody diarrhea. So uh, this will bring an end to the career of Nathaniel Bacon, and for all those people that he had motivated in recent months, they really needed a leader, and since their leader was now gone, the rebellion will then fall to pieces. 
So now you might justly wonder, well, Miss Ward, why do you talk about a rebellion that ultimately ended up being a failure? Well, because it shows us that class tensions mattered in the society. It also shows us that afterwards, uh, the gentry are so alarmed at this coalition that had been built amongst free or amidst, amongst slaves, indentured servants, and poor farmers that they wanted to make sure that something like this never happened again. They will shift away. This will hasten the shift away from indentured servitude instead to a system, a forced labor system based on skin color, one in which they could dominate. And this, of course, being the shift to African slavery, which we'll talk about in the next part of the lecture.